Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Butterfield, uh, United States Pacific Command, uh, with two questions for uh, Professor Wong. Uh, professor, if uh, the interpretation of Hai Chuan, sea power, is legalistic, as you suggest, or, or favored by 79% of your uh, poll, uh, and therefore rests on international law, uh, may I ask why you don't use international mechanisms like the UN's International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in uh, resolving your disputes, for example, with the Philippines? And a second question? <laughs> the second question is, uh, I always felt that the exercise of uh, Chinese sovereignty throughout the entire South China Sea uh, was a rather short-sighted strategy as you build a blue water navy, as you rise uh, as a global power. Uh, you'll want to use seas all over the world. And if you set a precedent in the South China Sea, uh, that other countries may exercise as you seek to protect sea and energy lines of communication, it seems like a, a paradox to me. All right. Um, uh, Ms. Butterfield, um, thank you very much for the question. I uh, understand that your second it's not really a question, it's a comment, so I would focus on your first question. <laughs> um, you know, so what I present here is, is empirical evidence. And as to how you can sort of reconcile that with, as you pointed to China's unwillingness to use international law to resolve disputes. You know, to be very honest, I really have some uh, different uh, disagreement or dif different understanding with regard to that. Uh, the case you uh, use cite here, uh, which is China's so-called refusal to uh, join the international tribunal, uh, this is actually completely consistent with international law, by the way, okay? And I also wanted to just point out that uh, for good or for bad, the United States also among, you know, those countries who have in the previous previously really uh, done the same thing. Um, I can give you a lot of examples, including the Nicaragua uh, suit of the uh, United States in the international court, and then you refuse to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, respond to that. So, so I think there's nothing uh, surprising to, or uh, quote, quote, unlegal, uh, illegal for a sovereignty uh, nation to uh, according to international, what international law stipulates, not to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to sort of take part in the uh, 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 tribunal proceedings, and also I think uh, China in this case, particularly China, has a very. Uh, I would encourage you if you would like, I can uh, uh, sort of more than happy to share with you more about more details of the uh, this particular case, and I think China really has a very uh, strong and valid reason to uh, not to. Uh, uh, take part in uh, the tribunal proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Kramer. On the outside, let me thank the three speakers for their excellent presentation. I'm Ramli bin Hajinik from uh, Duke University of Malaysia. My question is direct to my friend also, the Professor Joffrey T. With respect to his presentation, the challenges is rebalance between China and US. The fact that today we all know, with respect to sea power, US is second to none. So what are the mechanisms for you to explain further to rebalance this uh, development. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Yes, uh, one of the issues I tried to mention in my presentation was the difference between China as basically at the moment a regional maritime power and the United States as basically a global maritime power. It seems to me that that particular characterization of the two 
explains some of the problems that some people in the United States and some people in the Asia Pacific region see in confronting the United States. It's, it's a question of what Mahan called the concentration of force. Um, he argued that success comes to those that can concentrate force in the area of concern. The problem for the United States is that it is not just an Asia-Pacific power. It therefore has to disaggregate its naval power globally in order to um, defend its national interests and in order to do what it thinks is necessary to help or to contribute at any rate to the defense of the global system. That means that it has to spread its forces around the world. That means that it has to cope with a variety of different threats, uh, everything from the terrorists on jet skis to uh, land-based ballistic missiles, for example, in a way that makes what Mahan called a concentration of naval force uh, much more difficult. And this becomes evident, and I think we see that in some of the concerns expressed by the United States allies and partners in the Western Pacific uh, in that particular region. Um, it's, if you like, putting it very, very crudely, um, the whole of China against part of the United States. And uh, the United States also suffers, in quotes, um, from the fact that its presence in the Western Pacific, to an extent, is discretionary. It's not a function of geography. It's a function of perceptions of interest. And perceptions of strategic interest can shift. I'm not in any way suggesting they will, um, but the possibility exists, and that's something that local partners and local allies bear in mind as well. So that's why I think for all the advantages that the U.S. Navy globally has, uh, the strategic relationship between China and the United States is much closer in the area of concern than you might think by looking simply at questions of experience, uh, questions of fleet structure, fleet size, and so on and so forth. Can I, can I, make a yeah. I, I would like to uh, make a comment uh, regarding about that uh, from the, uh, the difference aspect. So from the uh, viewpoint of the military aspect, so U.S. advocated required to, uh, re uh, requirement to ensure its ability uh, to operate in anti-access, anti-denial environment. So as one of primary mission of the uh, U.S. armed force uh, in the national security strategy in 2012. So by the way, uh, such A2 AD concept is not quite a new trend. So we can see similar notion uh, in the U.S. maritime strategy in 1980s too. Uh, U.S. have estimated that uh, Soviet Navy attempt uh, sea control in uh, uh, around uh, waters such as the uh, Sea of Ohotsk so, and uh, operate in sea denial zone out of 2,000 kilometers from ashore as primary Soviet naval ta uh, tasking. So, however, you know, even such Cold War era, uh, both Navy uh, have never collided uh, unexpected. Uh, unexpectedly, so because a power balance was uh, maintained, uh, maintained basically, and uh, a, special, a specific common rule set due to avoid mis uh, miscalculation and uh, mis misread uh, was established, such as INCSI, Incident at Sea Agreement, and the agree uh, agreement on uh, prevention on dangerous military activities. So, uh, on the other hand, U.S.-China relation is completely different from uh, U.S.-Soviet relation for uh, former in this in the Cold War era. So both U.S.-China uh, economic stakeholder in this region and share reciprocal benefit. So moreover, U.S.-China can also cooperate in military field. So in the uh, Gulf of Eden, so both Navy uh, operate for same objective, so same manner, so although there are difference between uh, CTF and the national tasking. And this year, PLN Navy participated in the LIMPAC for the first time. It was precious experience to share the common value and uh, advance uh, mutual understanding. 
uh, there are more field there are more field for cooperation uh, to ensure regional military sec um, maritime security. Uh, the issue of the WMD piracy and the global terrorism and natural disaster, such challenges cannot be resolved by independent action of even US and China. So then international cooperation, including US and China, uh, is required to solve various re regional issues. As a result, such cooperation will encourage bilateral talks, transparency, and the common rule set, and uh, contribute to uh, evolve a stable relationship. Thank you. Could you move a little closer to the microphone? Hello. Mike O'Sullivan, uh, Royal Navy. I'm the Naval Advisor here in Canada. And I've got a question um, probably directed to uh, Dr. Wang, but also to the rest of the, uh, the panel. Um, NATO, we understand uh, cooperative deterrence quite well. Um, but one of the, uh, the statements made was about cooperative compellence. And uh, I'd like that elaborated on because uh, that's not something NATO probably understands as well. Um, we'll be happy to do so. <laughs> well, this is actually what I expected, I would say. Um, uh, um, this actually, the, uh, the, the, the concept I uh, sort of myself developed uh, as a way to, uh, as my personal view, I would argue that as China's uh, naval power uh, increases, one of the very uh, useful strategy I think China can uh, use is, is what I call cooperative um, deterrence and cooperative compliance. And uh, as, as uh, you probably all know that very well, that is the term uh, deterrence and compliance in the strategic studies really, uh, you know, have it's very important zero-sum nature. So which means if I prevail in, in the deterrence game, which means you fail. Um, or compliance, which is another uh, term uh, scholar comes for, uh, for refers to a strategic coercion, um, the, the same idea. But what I'm trying to argue he, here is that, well, you know, there's a different way uh, we can theorize or conceptualize uh, this, which is, for instance, uh, let me give you maybe one example, a specific example, which will uh, be illustrative. For instance, my own understanding of what China has been doing in the South China Sea is actually uh, maybe intuitively I would argue that Chinese leaders has been doing or is doing uh, what is doing is actually uh, can be explained by cooperative deterrence or cooperative components uh, which is uh, specifically on the one hand China would you know first of all let's uh, I would argue that uh, one of the key uh, dilemma for uh, we are facing in the South China Sea is actually because uh, our players, stakeholders, we are increasingly uh, trapped in a very classical prisoner dilemma, which is cooperation would be better, yes, everyone understand that. However, you would have stronger incentive to defect, quote, quote, defect from that cooperation game, which is, you know, by unilateral action, unilateral uh, drilling of oils and gases, et cetera, and, um, and, and you feel that will give you more benefits. And remember, ch uh, China, uh, back in the era of uh, former leader Deng Xiaoping, have uh, proposed this idea of uh, shelving differences and joint development. And, and uh, up to date, uh, I think this is still China's uh, uh, policy, and I believe it will also uh, be uh, China's uh, policy in the years to come. And, and precisely, so combine, you combine that goal with the increasing uh, uh, the military capability of China at China's disposal, which means China can use deterrence or compliance uh, in, in, in some cases. However, the ultimate goal here is not to uh, have a winner takes all game. Rather, is to force or compel your um, your, uh, the other players come back to the prisoner, uh, come back to, excuse me, the cooperation game. Therefore, providing a solution to the prisoner dilemma. So I think this is how I would conceptualize that. And uh, of course, very frankly, this is a scholarly, scholar's 
own little theory, and 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 and, and only uh, I wish I could talk to uh, uh, you know uh, my friends in the government uh, at some point as I further develop my theory. But I do see some uh, sort of validity in uh, thinking that way. But I I would be more than happy to hear your critique and also comments for uh, Professor and the General. Of course, yeah, Captain. Um, uh, as an academic. I absolutely cannot resist getting involved in this particular issue as well. Um, I absolutely agree with you. It, it seems to me that if China and the United States have an exclusively competitive view of deterrence and, and do see it, or do come to see it, as, as, as you describe, a zero-sum game, uh, then we're all in, in desperate trouble. Um, it seems to me that there are strong interests um, that both major players have in, if you like, deterring instability uh, rather than each other, um, although each other may be part of that instability in, in some cases. And I think that is clearly the way to go, and that's clearly been the, the, the major focus of, of all three of the presentations that you, you've heard this morning. But I do think there is something of a problem, if I, I may say so, um, when one looks at behavior in the South China Sea. Um, it seems to me that um, deterrence is about stopping things happening. Compellence is about making things happen. Uh, it seems to me that China's aims in the South China Sea are to prevent other claimants making the situation worse. Um, and deterrent, if that's what the, the aim is, and there's, you have two choices when, you, when you're operating deterrence. You deter by punishment or you deter by denial. Deterrence by denial means you stop the other side ever being able to do what they want to do. Deterrence by punishment means that you actually punish them for trying. Um, I would argue that that is the concept of deterrence that China has been following in the South China Sea. Perfectly understandably, perfectly legitimately. But it conflicts with this notion of cooperative deterrence with the United States because deterrence by punishment sets up perceptions. It exacerbates international relations. It gives strength, if you like, to what Beijing refers to as a China's threat theory. And so, in a sense, it, it, it argues against, it, it acts as a restraint on the possibilities of cooperative deterrence uh, between the United States and, and, uh, uh, and, and China. So I would argue that there might be a problem here between the strategic level interests that both countries have and the operational interests that sometimes that policy is characterized um, and implemented by in places like the South and East China Sea that maybe we could address if we had more time. Can I just yeah, briefly follow up? Uh, I uh, cannot resist this as well. <laughs> but um, I, uh, well, actually, as we all, all know that Professor Teo is really a, uh, the uh, uh, preeminent scholar in the field. So um, uh, I, know I completely agree with you because myself, I myself also teach uh, deterrence and, uh, and strategic coercion. So deter in the classical or conventional, I would call it conventional literature, uh, about deterrence is yes, deterrence, there are two different ways. You can do it by punishment or by denial. But I think what I'm, uh, I just want to say that what I'm trying to sort of the jump into really is a new theoretical uh, realm, I, I would uh, argue. Um, so we have to think about is what are the different ways or methods that they can do cooperative deterrence? And apparently you cannot, uh, you know, constrain yourself by the conventional way, which is punishment or, or denial. And I would argue that uh, at the minimal level, you know, I have to confess that I still, this is a work in progress, so I, I'm not able to pre uh, present with you a complete theory here. But some of the building blocks, maybe, uh, for instance, at least a combination, or you have to use uh, some of the different elements of those uh, methods at the same time. Okay, for instance, yes, there is a, a, a threat to punish uh, other players if they do not conform to the cooperation game, okay? But very importantly, always at the same time provide uh, the 
uh, the in positive inducement, so to speak, for or rewards, as you will, for a corporation. So you always have to do the same, the two things at the same time, which will amount to what I call the corporate deterrence. Otherwise, we are sort of, you know, sort of slipping back to uh, to the conventional deterrence. Hope this help. Okay, uh, I I agree uh, about the corporation about the, uh, counterterrorism, uh, in the, even in the China, uh, South China Sea. So uh, my comment is: so uh, U.S. and China uh, will be able to share the common value of the uh, sea, uh, 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 even in South China Sea as a lifeline. So, however, most typical difference uh, of their standpoint is. China is coastal state uh, in, uh, in this region, and the U.S. is a user of the sea, which is maritime state in this region. So generally speaking, it's just generally speaking, so coastal countries so, uh, have a tendency to seek to expand their control and jurisdiction from, from the viewpoint of security of uh, maritime right of interest and uh, uh, especially acqu acquirement of the maritime resources. So on the other hand, maritime states uh, want to search, uh, secure uh, their open activities uh, in the sea, especially freedom of navigation. So in this situation, following three move movement uh, may factor whether stabilize or de destabilize U.S.-China relation. So one is a challenge of power, a change of uh, power balance in maritime realm. So especially between coastal state and the maritime state, it's unstable, uh, unstable factor, uh, mainly from the security as, as, uh, aspect. The second is attempt to uh, challenge the status quo uh, for fr free use of the sea as global commons uh, unilaterally. It's unstable, unstable uh, factor, mainly from the economic uh, basis. Then, uh, so on the other hand, so development of maritime cooperation, so such activity, uh, for example, counter piracy operation and uh, counter terrorism uh, in even the uh, uh, South China Sea, uh, is should be stable factor. Uh, please, uh, if you will, very briefly, and then we'll take the question one and then two. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, General uh, Emery Watana. Be very, uh, very interesting comments. <laughs> and uh, I would, uh, I, I think your distinction between the two type of uh, uh, countries, coastal versus maritime, I think is useful uh, uh, in a way. Uh, but uh, please allow me, you know, just to as an uh, academic professor to be a, a, a sort of a critical a little bit here, which is I'm wondering whether or not it was whether or not it would be too sort of rigid or fixed uh, distinguishing uh, referring China as a coastal country and the United States as a maritime country because as I just argue in my own presentation, China actually is in the transition from a very traditional continental power to a maritime power, probably in the years and decades to come. So we have to take that dynamics also into account when we try to explain the different behaviors in these two countries. And very last words, I would also argue that when it comes to South China Sea, uh, we have to put this into perspective as well. And I would argue that, uh, you know, there's a lot of myths about the freedom of navigation is being disrupted in South China Sea. To be very honest, if you are fair, you know, for all fair-minded uh, analysts, I think when you look at the, the map and situation of sea, you know, where is this disruption of, of freedom of navigation? When you look at number and data and on daily basis, how many ships are going through South China Sea, you, you immediately understand there's no uh, imminent threat to, uh, to the freedom of navigation in South China Sea. And also, I would argue that, last words, that there is actually shared interest of the maintenance of freedom of navigation uh, between China, the United States, and all other stakeholders. Because, because after all, I think uh, China also depends, very much its economic uh, life also depends on freedom of navigation in South China Sea. Thank you.
Thank you. Right. Thank you. I would just, uh, before the question, make the observation that one of our follow-on panels will be on maritime disputes, and my spider senses tell me that South China Sea and East China Sea may come up in more detail during that panel. So uh, please proceed with your comment or question, you. identifying yourself by name and country first. Okay, my name is Ferit Kerkov. I'm the Executive Vice President of Conference of Defense Association Institute, which happens to be in Canada. Uh, I've enjoyed tremendously the dispute or the discussion between deterrence, compellence, and all of that. But if you look at the general comment of what is going on in the East and South China Sea, as reported in the West, it is basically argued that China is flexing its muscles. And the, com the corollary to that one is that if it doesn't get its way, it will be reinforced internally, and if it gets its way, while well, it continues to expand its control. Now, I presume, Professor Wong, that you would disagree with the way the West portrays what you're doing, but I'd love to hear you a bit more on it. Um, you know, I actually recently has published a, an article I would strongly uh, Sorry, you know, I refer you to uh, uh, to that, which is the, uh, I uh, call it a title with a title: "How We Should Not Misread China, uh, China's Behavior," uh, which appears at ASEAN Forum uh, back a few months ago. Uh, in which, really, I think you know we have to. Uh, I argue that uh, there is actually a lot of uh, sort of mis uh, presentation of China, so misunderstanding of China's motives and behavior of us uh, in the Western uh, media and, uh, and the strategic uh, policy circles. And, and in fact, uh, there is also, we have to take the Chinese perspective into account, really. Because, uh, you know, uh, from the Western, the, the story of the Western media, as you just described, is in which China flexes its muscle and try to get its way and uh, is using threats and etc. But also, you know, um, there's also a very strong and growing sentiment in China, which is uh, we have been so restrained in the past decades, more than one decade, many years, when it comes to, for instance, South China Sea. And China actually is the last country, last country, to start doing this recommendation of uh, the, the features uh, it uh, occupies in the South China Sea. And however, when China starts doing this, we get immediately single out, unfortunately, by, you know, um, we all know. <laughs> and it get criticized. So, so I think that really makes the Chinese uh, uh, leaders and public really frustrated or even very angry because this is completely unfair. Um, and there is also a strong, uh, a growing sentiment that you know we have been playing nice, but unfortunately, our good face is really bad face from other. So we, this is what I just described as increasingly uh, a trap in the prisoner dilemma game. So how are we going to change that? Uh, again, here is what I argue that the conventional understanding of deterrence or comparison has. Ha, does has its own lim, uh, limitation, and that's why I'm trying to be a little bit creative, uh, innovative here. I'm trying to sort of develop a theory by arguing, proposing that maybe the cooperative deterrence and cooperative compliance will be way out. And I would argue that this is actually the, uh, uh, explain to a great extent what the Chinese uh, uh, government has been doing. Yeah, I, I agree with much of that, in fact. Um, I think we in the West have a tendency to apply what's sometimes known in the trade as black box thinking. In other words, assuming that China is like a person, it has one view. Um, it doesn't. It has lots of different constituencies with lots of different views. And one of them, as, as, as Dr. Wang has just said, is, is public opinion. The, the social media um, empowers public opinion much more to regard the defense of territory, the defense of disputed islands, as a kind of performance indicator of how well the government is doing. And this is something that no government, whatever its um, political affiliations, can afford to ignore. I think one problem that Beijing faces um, is that it is, if you like, in a strategic bind. If it resolutely, resolutely def defends what it believes are its interests in the South and East China Sea, um, it may provide evidence for the China threat theory. If it doesn't do that, 
it's subject to criticism from its own people and from substantial uh, elements in, 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 in uh, uh, the various constituencies that make up um, China. I think the only solution, if there is a solution, over the long term is for China finally to learn that awful lesson that all great powers have to learn sooner or later. That being a great power sometimes means that you have to accept being bullied by the weak. And, and that's significant. It means that you don't necessarily, uh, when the Philippines does something that in your view is stupid and provocative, uh, necessarily kick back twice just to teach the, uh, the Philippines a lesson and ban their bananas and all the rest of it. You have to ride with it. You have to accept that sometimes weak powers on the periphery of a great power do behave in a provocative way and try and ignore it. I'm sorry, we had yeah, one question here, and then, sir, in the back, we'll take you next. And please start with your name and your country. Thank you, moderator. Uh, my name is Ras. I am director, program director for Maritime Security Studies, Indonesia Defense University. Uh, allow me to express my highly appreciated to all of the panelists. Um, I am uh, very interested with the Geoffrey Thiel that you mentioned about the national uh, rivalries and national integrity dilemma, actually. Um, yeah, if you talk about the naval rebellions to the Asia Pacific, sometimes we have a joke in Indonesia because there is the naval imbalance in the Asia Pacific. So why the naval rebellions to the Asia Pacific? The answer is because there is a naval imbalance. But in the academic exercise in my campus, sometimes my students ask, what is actually the concept of rebellions to the Asia Pacific? Perhaps uh, Professor Geoffrey Thiel can uh, describe to us how to the roadmap, how to make the roadmap of rebellions to the Asia Pacific so we can convince to the public, especially in my institution. Because sometimes we say that rebellions is the rivalries can be make the conflict, but if we talk about the competitiveness, we can say that it can be solve the problems. Um, my my question is to to Geoffrey Tills, how to how to make the clear roadmap that rebellions to the Asia Pacific or maritime security issues can be, can be, uh, uh, I mean, can be uh, strategic issues, uh, especially to the developing countries in the Southeast Asia. Um, and also, I would like to say that when we talk the rebellions to the Asia Pacific, yeah, it's very broad. We can. Uh, talk about the maritime defense issues, maritime economic issues, and maritime governance issues. And mostly, uh, we talk about also the, 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 what do you call it, the recovery and response issues in the, in the regions. And, and that's why we have to make it clear what kind, the defense capabilities, the economic uh, maritime issues, or the governance. So I think uh, Professor, uh, Professor Thiel can, can give us uh, a little bit of, on, on this, on this issues. Uh, the last, I would like to share the comment. If, if perhaps we could stop with those two questions uh, so the professor here can keep up with you. Um, so let, let's hold it, those two questions, and then Professor Till, if you could respond to those. We're rapidly coming to the end of our discussion period, so I'd like to get through this question, and then there's one more gentleman I, I promised uh, uh, would have the, uh, the microphone next, so thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for uh, an interesting reminder of the fact that when we talk about the Asia-Pacific region, we should by no means restrict our discussion to the chief players, uh, i.e. the United States and China. There are other major and significant uh, stakeholders in what is the evolving naval uh, rebalance in the Asia-Pacific who, whose interest um, we, we need to consider. Um, I did refer to what I think is one of the substantial uh, maritime interests that all those local countries have, um, apart from hoping that the relationship between the United States and China is a sustainable and stable one that provides a framework within for the general peace and security of the whole region. After all, they all trade with China. Many of them see the United States, however, as their first and foremost port of call when it comes to security. They do not want to have to choose. And therefore, it behoves both the US and China, if you like, to explicate very carefully uh, what their strategies towards each other are and the role that they expect uh, local players uh, to play in that. But let me leave that issue and go on to something else. And it seems to me that all the developing countries of the region, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, all of them have exactly the same kind of maritime incentives to um, rebalance, if you, if you like, towards the sea that the bigger countries do and all the rest of us do as well. And in many cases, this is sustained even more by the sense that many of those countries are not geographically unitary states. Effectively, they're spread over numbers of islands, particularly in the case, obviously, of the Philippines and, and Indonesia. And it's in that sense that national integrity is associated with sea power. Without sea power, um, if you like, those bits of disparate countries can't be uh, regarded safely as, as part of the whole. And it, they may be less than the sum of a, uh, a country like the Philippines if it loses uh, its capacity to use the sea between the various parts of the Philippines uh, will become less than the sum of its parts. So they all have uh, those interests, if you like. The danger, and I, I would, this is why I was trying to distinguish between um, sovereignty and security, um, as opposed to sovereignty and integrity. Integ sovereign, sorry, sea power as a guarantor of national integrity. The danger if you associate sovereignty and security is that it exacerbates exactly those claim, rival claims that we've seen and we will hear more about in both the East and South China Sea to uh, the general disbenefit of all. So I would argue effectively that when developing sea power and the understanding of sea power and trying to transmit this understanding to publics and to politicians in all their countries, that they should try to avoid the association of sovereignty with security. And uh, just now, so Japan Maritime Security Defense Force uh, will uh, so make a relationship with the Indonesian Navy. So such a bilateral relationship is very important. However, so I, as I mentioned, so no nation can tackle the uh, complex uh, so, uh, security circumstance. Uh, then, so you have a framework uh, of the uh, ARF or ASEAN. So such a uh, framework is very important for secu uh, maritime security in, in this region. So if you uh, concentrate to effort uh, to ensure the maritime security to the ASEAN or ARF framework, so it becomes to the middle power navies. Then, so uh, we, uh, so middle power navies, so can Canada and uh, Australia and Japan, so we uh, will support uh, for your framework uh, with the uh, U.S. Navy. Thank you. And we had a, a question from this quarter here. Um, please, sir. Um, so my name is Tai Ming Chung. I'm from the University of California, San, San Diego. 
And I wanted to ask about um, Russia itself. Given what's been going on in the Ukraine and, and Crimea, what does the panelists see in terms of the maritime strategic implications of what Russia um, in the Asia Pacific for what Russia is doing? Is it, as we don't seem to have Russians in the room or we haven't really talked about it, is it continuing to be sort of um, a minor play player um, for the long term? Or do we see any significant developments? Because I noted um, in April, China and Russia did a very significant military naval exercises itself, and the Russians are back at least aviation-wise, um, like um, dealing um, with Jap um, invading Japanese airspace, etc. So I wanted to, to see what you see both immediately and over the long term in terms of Russia's role in the maritime strategic balance. Right. Thank you for that question. If I could ask each of our panelists to take about a minute each, and that'll bring us to the, the close of this morning's session. That's a really big question. We should have a conference on that, I think. Um, as far as Europe is concerned, um, I think it, it's a timely reminder of the tensions there are bet between getting involved in other parts of the world like the Asia Pacific and the notion that defense begins and perhaps ends at home. There is a debate going on in NATO about what the naval response to the Crimean uh, issue should be, and that's at the tactical and operational level. Where should our priorities be? Should they be in Europe and go back to being in Europe, or should we continue to be uh, developing our interests in other parts of the world? I think tactically, uh, there's a bit of a withdrawal and, and a focus on this sort of issue. The longer-term debate about what does this tell us about Russia? Or what does this tell us about Mr. Putin, to be more precise? Uh, should we expect the same kind of behavior in other parts of the world? Well, frankly, I don't think so. Um, it seems to me that Crimea and the, uh, and the, quotes, Russian part of the Ukraine is a distinctive political problem that's left over by uh, the settlement of the end of the Cold War. I don't think um, that we should automatically assume that we're going to see other examples of this sort of thing, uh, particularly in the Asia Pacific. But the worrying thing is, we can't be sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Taimin, for uh, asking the big question for the very end. But please allow me to give a very uh, short answer to your big question. Um, and also with a slightly different angle here. I, at first, I fully, excuse me, <coughs> Counter with uh, Professor Thiel's his uh, argument that we should not sort of automatically assume, you know, uh, the similarities or assume there's uh, the same logic is going to unfold in uh, in East Asia. And uh, in fact, I think I have in, in, in rec recently I have read some uh, writings by uh, some U.S. strategic analysts. Basically, they are arguing that. Uh, you know, wow! Well, you know, because uh, Russia has, has been uh, has been doing this uh, expansion, uh, change of status quo in the Crimea. Therefore, we have to draw a line, uh, get tough uh, in South China Sea in case that China will do something in South China, in South China Sea. To be very honest, I found such kind of argument really, really sort of um, lack of uh, clear logic here. Because uh, number one. I think they have, has misunderstand the China's uh, mod motives of behavior. The reason that China has been very restrained uh, in its behavior in the South China Sea when it comes to South China Sea is not because, not because deter uh, the American deterrence, um, and rather it is because China cares so much about its own image and its own its own relations with its regional countries. We have to take that, uh, I think, as aspect into account in case we will not arrive at a very, what I uh, believe as a very mistaken, uh, wrong-headed argument like uh, what we have read uh, in, uh, uh, in the policy community recently. Thank you. As, as for the Japan, so, uh, so as you may know, so we have uh, t uh, two territorial disputes uh, in the uh, sea of Japan, uh, Takeshima, and uh, northern part, uh, northern territory uh, with uh, Russia. So, uh, however, so, uh, we uh, Japanese Navy uh, have a close cooperation uh, with so, uh, Russian Navy, and uh, uh, still continue to uh, so carry out the uh, bilateral uh, search and rescue exercise anytime. So. Uh, 
So it's uh, such a territorial dispute with Russia is uh, just a diplomatic and a political issue. So it's different from a uh, military issue, uh, we think. Then, so we, ha we have no plan to challenge to change the status quo uh, about the, such a territorial is issue in the northern part of, of Japan uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, then uh, it's very, uh, we think it's very important to keep open the a uh, door for the dialogue between uh, navies. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in a warm round of applause for our three panelists. <laughs>